I like the one with the whistly man in the woods who lives in the trees. <laughs> if you haven't watched the Andy Griffith show, I'm sure none of this makes any sense. But uh, hi, my name is Mark and welcome to the channel. Today I'm sitting down with you to answer some of the questions you've asked me in the comments of videos ranging from the start of my time on YouTube to now. So I've got my knitting on the needles. I'm ready to sit, answer some questions, and hopefully have some time with you. Let's get into it. So we're back for another uh, question and answer video. And uh, again, I have my husband sitting across the room more comfortably by the window uh, to ask me some of these questions as I knit. And I'm still working on my weekender here. Uh, yes, if you're wondering, this was filmed at the same time as the last question and answer video. So <laughs> my weekender is not eternal, but um, here we are. <laughs> Okay, this first question is from Joshi46032, who says, It was interesting to me that you spoke of caked yarn as, quote, things that are now stash yarn, but you don't speak of the yarn on your pegboard in that way. Do you consider untouched or uncaked yarn not part of your stash? That's a great question. So um, stash is such a big topic for crafters. Some people love stat building their stash. They like to buy things almost for the sake of buying things to start a collection. And I get that because then when you have a project you want to do, especially if it requires lots of colors or a variety of yarn choices, you can shop from your own stash. You can shop from what you have. Other people are of the mind that you should only buy something if you are ready to use it and that you know you will use it. And I think neither person in this situation is right, neither person is wrong. So I try not to develop too big of a stash. When I buy yarn, 90% of the time I know exactly what it's going to be. I've picked the pattern and so I'm choosing the fiber weight and color and quantity specifically to fit that project, and then I do that project. Sometimes I change my mind and it turns into something else, but I'm still using that project quantity. Um, when I travel, or if there are special occasions, things like um, the yarn tour that happens in my area of Ohio, and I'm going to stores and they have specialty colorways, they have things that are meant to celebrate the event, celebrate the yarn tour, or the festival, whatever's going on, um, in those situations I, I will take part and I'll buy a single skein or something that doesn't yet have a purpose. So that's typically how my stash gets built. And now this question has to do with skeins that are untouched, that are unwound, versus my skeins that are already wound um, sort of on a separate portion of my pegboard. And I'll drop in a little bit of my pegboard footage here just so you know what I mean. So the yarn that is on the left side of the pegboard that is still skeined, those are things typically that um, are not yet in use. They are waiting for their projects that I've already decided, or they might be some of those specialty yarns that I bought as part of some other event. The yarns on the right side of the pegboard that are already caked are partial skeins. So when I wind up my yarn, I have a full skein here that will be going into the sweater I'm currently working on. Um, it's skeined because I know, or it's caked because I know I'm using it, I'm actively doing the project. But if I have leftovers, if I only use 10, 20, 30 grams of a 100 gram cake, I have quite a bit left. So it's going to stay caked. It doesn't get re skeined. It doesn't go back into its hank. And I put it on a different part of the wall. And that's so that I know that it's already been used. So it's not a full skein. I can't use it for its full yardage, but I could use it in the future for a smaller project, maybe a color work project, um, something like that. So yes, they're still stash yarns, but in my mind, they've already been claimed. They've already been used, and so some of them eventually uh, will be used over and over again for stripes, for color work, and 
I just need that distinction in my mind. So when I'm shopping at home, shopping from my stash, I know what is untouched that can be larger projects. And I know what has already been used that might have to go to smaller scrap busting projects. I hope that makes sense. Our next question is from a user who says, I live on social security and love to crochet. I just ran out of yarn and it doesn't fit in my budget. Are there any ideas on where I can get more cheaply or for free? I just want regular yarn, nothing special. Yeah, totally. So there are a lot of places, depending on where you live in the world, and I don't know where you are uh, specifically, but at least in the US uh, where I live, there are several places where people um, knit and crochet, they craft in a very frugal way. So there are lots of um, guilds and groups that focus on taking yarn donations. So when someone passes away, when someone no longer wants their fiber and they're getting rid of it, hopefully they can look for a place to donate the fiber. They're not just trashing it. Um, sometimes people take things to um, charity shops, places like Goodwill, and you can find needles, hooks, yarn. Um, if you find things there, definitely make sure that you give them a chance to air out. Maybe you put them in the oven, maybe you put them in the freezer, you cook them, you freeze them, just to make sure you're not bringing any critters, moths, or moth eggs into your home. Um, but that can be a great place to look. So I would recommend checking charity shops, resale shops, checking for guilds in your area, see if there are groups that knit and crochet for charity because they're often using yarn that is free to them, that has been donated. And um, if you're looking for patterns and uh, resources like that for free, check out your libraries. Um, so many libraries have pattern books, instruction books, how-to books that you can check out for free. And a lot of the groups that I know of that knit for charity and that have their own stashes of donated free yarn meet through libraries. So if you happen to be in the US and you're looking for very frugal ways to get your hands on fiber and to practice your craft, those would be my recommendations. This one is a follow-up to your stash question. This is from Social Skills Will, who says, I love the idea of a pegboard. I was just telling my partner about possibly using that as a yarn storage solution. Where did you get yours and are you happy with it? Yes, I'm super happy with my pegboard. Um, I'll put another clip of it up <laughs> in case you weren't looking at the screen the last time it was up. Uh, my pegboards came from Lowe's. They were like 10 or $12 per board and they're pretty large. Um, I'll try to link the board up on the screen as well because I'm sure it will advertise the dimensions and the actual cost. And I just put them up with some screws and I put washers, sort of thick spacers, behind the boards so that I have room to affix the pegs. Um, speaking of the pegs, I went with a rounded tip peg. A lot of pegs for pegboards are sharp on the end and I didn't want that in my house in case somebody bumps into it or falls over. I don't want them to get stabbed by my yarn wall. So I went with rounded tip pegs that I found through Amazon and I have two boards up now. Uh, in the future, if I have a larger space for storing my crafting supplies, I might put up more pegboards because I love the flexibility. I like that I can store hanks of yarn that are still skeined. I like that I can store cakes of yarn and I can move the pegs wherever I need. And in the future, I might also want to store some of my tools, some of my needles and scissors and um, spools of things up on the board as well. This one is appropriate since you're knitting it right now. Can you turn the Weekender into a vest? You can totally turn the Weekender into a vest. So the Weekender by Andrea Mowry is what I'm working on right now. Um, <clears throat> I'll hold it up. Uh, it, the Weekender is made inside out, so it looks like stockinette knit fabric, but at the end of the process, you flip it inside out. And you have this detail of a faux seam running up the front. Uh, it's really pretty. And the Weekender is very boxy and it's a drop shoulder. So the only thing that's tricky about turning it into a vest is that you'll still have the dropped shoulders. So if you're okay having a dropped shoulder sort of cap sleeve on your vest, then the only thing you have to do is once you finish the body of the sweater, instead of 
picking up around and knitting sleeves, I would still pick up around the armholes and I would knit one to two inches of ribbing. You could do one by one or two by two ribbing just to finish that edge. Or if you really like the idea of an open sort of rolled edge from the stockinette or reverse stockinette fabric, you could leave it as is. It would look a little bit more rustic that way. So I think the Weekender would be a very cute vest. I don't know if Andrea Mowry markets it as a vest in any of her pattern iterations. Um, she might already do that. But um, if you've made the Weekender before, or if you are considering that pattern, you could totally make it into a vest. A lot of people say <laughs> you can leave all of your sweaters without sleeves and just finish them as vests. So for the most part, it works for a lot of things. When you did the room renovation, uh, WNTR Dove said, love the makeover. I'm doing something similar and love the idea of the vases for your yarn scraps. Can you share where you got them? Yes. Um, so I have these vases behind me. And a friend of mine, Beth Lucci, I've heard does the same thing. I don't know if it's true. It could just be a rumor um, where she keeps yarn scraps. So I mentioned a few minutes ago when I have partial cakes, partial skeins of yarn remaining, I put them in a separate place on my yarn wall. Those are still pretty big. That's like when I have 40, 50 grams or more. Um, so almost a half or full skein of yarn. But when I get down to little bits, little scraps remaining, I put them into a vase. So this vase is for my fingering weight yarn scraps. And uh, you can see from the above head camera, it's fun. I've got all sorts of scraps in here. So I think it's a fun idea. Then I've got little bits if I'm doing a stash buster project or making something really small. So I got these from At Home, which is a store in the US. I don't know if they're all over. They're in the Midwest, they're in the South. It's just a, a home goods chain. chain store. So um, I don't particularly need them to be super sturdy uh, because I'm not filling them with water or anything, but I just wanted something that would be, I thought it would be pretty. I don't actually love how it looks on camera. That's okay. <laughs> I think it's a good storage solution. So I got them at, at home, but I imagine you could find them most places. Um, even from like a, a floral or a plant store might have the biggest array of sizes. This is from Let's Teach Leslie, who says that they are a huge fan of the Andy Griffith show and they want to know what is your favorite episode? Uh, so I saw this question. You know, I don't know that I have a favorite episode. I think I'm a little bit scarred from the Andy Griffith show. I don't know that I have an answer. I do love the pickle episode. I saw that you said that in your comment. I like the one where Obi is supposed to be taking piano lessons or something because I was practicing the piano and I was supposed to be taking piano lessons as a kid. Um, so I don't know, piano lessons. I like all of the um, the moonshine episodes. I like the one with the whistly man in the woods who lives in the trees. <laughs> if you haven't watched the Andy Griffith show, I'm sure none of this makes any sense. But uh, yeah, I'd say I'm a little bit scarred from the experience of having to watch so many episodes forever. But yes, pickles, super funny. Yeah, <laughs> good question. This is from Jane Scully, who says, do you have trouble blocking superwash yarn? That's a good question. So um, I think this will probably be the last question of this video. So I'm a big believer in blocking everything I make. Um, I like the way it finishes a garment or a piece. I think it really creates a cohesive layer of fabric and it often helps my stitches and my tension look even better than they really are. So do I have trouble blocking superwash? I, I don't think so. I think that the results of blocking a superwash wool are just as nice as the results of blocking a non-superwash wool. However, I find that a superwash wool grows and stretches so much more than a non-superwash wool. 
For example, um, the sweaters I have made from superwash yarn have grown in length substantially from their dimensions pre-block. And the first time that happened, I wasn't expecting it. So I made the sweater the appropriate length to fit me and my frame. And then I blocked it and I blocked it to the dimensions I needed. So I made sure to scrunch it up, scooch it together on my blocking boards. But then after it was completely dry and I wore it, I noticed in the first two or three wears that with the weight of the fabric, the sweater stretched and became three, four inches longer than it was after I had blocked it. And in, in some lights i was a little disappointed because i thought okay now the sweater is longer than i wanted it to be and it fits me differently but now i'm happy with the length i've gotten used to it feeling like a slightly longer slightly oversized sweater so for blocking anything blocking super washable non-super washable it doesn't matter i take the results of blocking into account so if i'm making a non-super wash sweater that retains its shape a little bit better but still grows um, in the blocking process at least, I, I stop the length before I reach what I really want. So as I'm trying my sweater on during the knitting process, if I get close to the length that I would like, I consider it, I consider how much it's going to grow when I block it, and I stop there. So I stop my non-superwash sweaters at least two to three inches short of where I really want them to end, because I know that in the blocking process, I will lay them out to the dimensions I want, and that will set the final length I would like. For a superwash sweater, I stop them a little earlier, maybe an inch or two earlier than I would for a non-superwash. And a lot of this is trial and error. It depends on the yarn that you're using. So yes, uh, there are tricky elements to using a superwash wool, especially in the way it can grow. If you've made the sweater as big as you want it to be, both in circumference and length, and then you block it and then you wear it, it's going to get even bigger. And that might really frustrate some people. So keep that in, keep that in mind um, if you're ever making a superwash garment, that it's going to grow. It's going to have a lot of flexibility and a lot of stretch depending on the stitch you're using. And uh, take that into account. I think I would, I would leave space for it to grow. So when I make superwash sweaters, I sometimes make them a size down. So it's going to be a little snug on me or really fitted when I first try it on, but then I block it and I block it with the idea that I'm getting two, three, four more inches out of the circumference. So then when I put it on after the blocking process, it now has four to five inches of ease and the appropriate length. So I imagine that's the, the angle you were coming at with the question, and I totally get that. And it absolutely affects the sizing, the dimensions of how I consider making my projects. So right now, to, to cap this whole thing off, I am working on a weekender out of Malabrigo Rios, which is a beautiful super wash wool. And the color I'm using here is teal feather. So you can see a little bit of the sweater. I'm so bad at um, gauging the, the mirrored effect of looking at myself and what I'm doing in a monitor. Um, so as I'm making this sweater, I am making it so that it will fit the recipient. It will be fitted. It will fit them um, in a snug manner because I know that when I block this sweater, let me zoom out a little, you can already see from the... Um, from the stitch I'm using and the needle size called for, this fabric is extremely stretchy. And it's stretchy in its length. If I give it just a gentle tug, I can stretch this out four or five inches. And I, I don't want to stretch my final sweater. I don't want to make something so small that I have to aggressively block it and pin it out to get it to fit. But I know that naturally, this texture, this stitch in Rios is going to have that stretch so that when the wearer puts this sweater on and they wear it for a day or two, it's going to grow. It's going to give them a little more length and a little more circumference. So I'm making a sweater that matches 
their measurements, like their bust measurement almost exactly, where I don't want the sweater to pull tightly on their bust, but if I make it to fit their bust, I know that in the blocking process and by the time they wear it, we're going to have an additional three to five inches. So that's going to give them the ease that they want for the fit. And the same thing is true for the length. So I'm following the instructions for length. I don't want it to end up being a cropped sweater, but I don't need to add any length to it. I don't need to make sure that it fits their dimensions before it's blocked. I'm going to, I'm going to make it so that it's three inches shorter than their dimensions. So by the time I block it, by the time they wear it, we will have gained those three inches and it will hopefully fit like a dream. Uh, with Superwash, because it grows so much, you can go back in and reblock things. If you wear a sweater and you've worn it five or six times and it's just too big, it's too drapey, you can reblock it. You can spritz it and reblock it, you can soak it and reblock it, and you can really cinch things in and it will hold for the first four to five wears before it stretches out again. I know a lot of people who've been so burned by that that they say, I'm not making any more superwash sweaters, and other people that just make the adjustments so that it works out in their favor. Um, another thing you can do if it's the neckline that's way too big, if it's a cardigan and it's just falling off, you can go in and you can reinforce that neck. You can do it by crocheting a chain along the inside. You can do it with stay tape. There are several solutions to things like that. Um, but I understand it can be frustrating. Of course, all of these promises I'm making depend on your gauge, the stitch used, and the fiber in question. The method I use is based on my own trial and error, and my best advice is to check your gauge, block your gauge swatch, and take notes on how projects measure before and after blocking. Hopefully, all of this will save you time in the future. So I hope some of those points have addressed your question, and... Um, Thank you to everyone. Thanks for asking questions, and thank you to Ned for asking them to me today. Thank you so much for sticking around to the end of this video. I really appreciate the time you spend with me on the channel. If it's your first time here, I hope there's something you found in my video that you enjoyed, and if you are returning to my channel, thank you. Thank you for trusting me. Thanks for um, accepting me as one of your friends, as somebody that you want to spend time with. So I hope that some of the answers today, some of the topics I covered have been intriguing, have been helpful, enlightening, um, or thought-provoking for you in some way. Uh, check out the description box for all sorts of things, for other videos to watch, for information you should know, um, things I want you to know. Um, I've got a PO box now. I'd love to hear from you if you want to write to me. Um, I'll pop that up on the screen. And uh, make sure if you write, let me know if it's something that I can share on the channel. I'd love to open up whatever you send me and share it with everybody else. And if you have more questions, drop them in the comments below, and uh, I'll answer them hopefully in a future video. Thanks again for being here with me. Happy knitting, happy crocheting, happy crafting to you, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Thank you.